We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And this, of course, is part of our Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson on July 4th, 1776. And before we go any further, please remember to hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to talk about the 1790s in in Savannah, Georgia. Before we get into our story, because YouTube is its own little land of weirdness, I do have to say that I do have on the same outfit from our previous video that I released the day before. As I've said before, I am film multiple videos in a day sometimes. So I do have to mention that because YouTube makes me mention why I have the same outfit on, but there you go. All right, let's get started. Now, when we did a long time ago, when they first started this channel, I talked about Thomas Paine and his common sense and the stuff that he believed in. And what I'm gonna talk about in regards to this story has a lot to do with common sense and Thomas Paine. You see, here's the thing about our modern world history. One thing that people maybe understand or don't understand. The philosophy of America, who we are as Americans, is anti-establishment. We are one of the few countries in our modern world to not have a monarch. We, our ancestors, my ancestors, did not want to be under the rule of divine right. Now, some might know, some might not know. Uh, this is one thing that Thomas Paine didn't believe in. Divine right is what we see with monarchy that you were born into a bloodline, you were born into a ruling family, and that makes you the ruler. Through most of our history, we have had kings and queens. They intermarry each other to create political ties and bonds, and especially during the Protestant Reformation, things got really messy. Because you see, when you are living under a monarchy, it is what the monarchy says is what goes. You're giving up, really, your idea of free thought and free living. And it's no secret that when the colonies started to form in the New World, people were coming to the colonies to start a new life. Some were seeking religious freedom, some were seeking the ability to be able to own land. You see, for a lot of history, owning land was what established your wealth. And as the colonies were being settled, there was a lot of infighting between other European countries. You had England there, you had France there, you had Spain there. All of these big empires were trying to get a hold on this new world. Now, obviously, England ended up being the dominant winner in that little argument between continental Europe. That's why we speak English and not French. But by the mid 1700s, the colonists were fed up. By this point, we have a few generations of people living in the New World who had never even been to Mother England. The crown, the English crown, was still requiring the colonists to pay taxes to the crown, even though they had no representative speaking on their behalf in the British Parliament. There's a famous saying, taxation without representation is tyranny. This was the 1765 Stamp Act of Congress. And then later on, a more famous revolt happened, and that was the Boston Tea Party that happened in 1773. You see, all this tea had come in, and a lot of patriots jumped on the boat and dumped the tea into the ocean. 
when this happened, it caused a huge uproar. How dare you patriots, you colonists, do this to us? Well, it just so happened that all of the other 12 colonies backed Massachusetts. For the most part, the colonists were banding together. Everyone wanted independence. Besides maybe Georgia and a few other loyalists, we were seeing the birth of a nation. Nobody wanted to be associated with England and they did not want to be ruled by a monarchy that lived on the other side of the ocean. You see, the American patriots, the colonists, wanted to self-govern. And in 1775, they set up a Congress to resist England. And then things really amped up in 1776. It was on July 2nd, 1776, that this Congress declared King George III a complete tyrant. They declared that the colonists, that all the colonies on the New World were free and independent. And then two days later, on July 4th, Thomas Jefferson wrote his famous Declaration of Independence, which was, again, declaring that we were independent. We were not a part of England and therefore would not be paying taxes to the English crown. Now, 56 delegates from all over the colonies signed the Declaration of Independence, the most famous signature being John Hancock, where we get the expression, give me your John Hancock, meaning give me your signature. Now, what I don't think people actually, or children today, American children, actually understand is the gravity of what had happened. You see, by Thomas Jefferson and all these men who signed this Declaration of Independence did, was they committed high treason. They basically told the crown to get out of here. And if they had lost the American Revolution, I'm pretty sure they probably would have been executed. But you see, that's how passionate they were about having freedom and making sure their descendants lived in a world where there was no establishment, where the people were the establishment, where the people governed the government, where the people were allowed to dispose of a government if it became too tyrannical. Now, of course, the United States of America is a totally different territory in a different land than England. Our weather is very different. Therefore, we are able to produce different and more abundant crops. Letting go of America, letting it have its own independence was not in the best interest for England. They were not gonna be making the money off of the colonists that they had been making through their taxing. And so by the colonists declaring independence, they basically declared war on the crown. Now, as I said earlier, we're looking at now in the 1700s, the late 1700s, as a few generations of babies being born in the colonies. Yes, of course, we still had people emigrating over to the United States, but for the most part of the people who made up the Continental Army, these were kids that knew the land. The British troops that were sent over to fight the colonists did not know the land. And as far as the southern states, we're looking at temperatures and terrain that are extremely different. These boys during this time knew how to handle the Georgia, the South Carolina, the North Carolina, the Tennessee heat, unlike the British troops who were used to a colder climate. They knew the Appalachian Mountains. They knew where things were and how to get around. The British troops did not. And something kind of ironic as well is that the, the British troops wore red coats. They were the red coats. As Paul Revere said as he came through town screaming, the red coats are coming, the red coats are coming. You could spot them a mile away. And something the Patriots had, the colonists had, that the British soldiers didn't have. They had passion. They had something that they were willing to die for. I myself am a descendant of two men who fought in the American Revolution. My boyfriend is also a descendant of a man who fought in the American Revolution.
In fact, we Americans take so much pride in our ancestry that there are organizations, the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Sons of the American Revolution. Not just anybody can be a part of these organizations. In fact, if you want to be a part of the Daughters of the American Revolution or the Sons of the American Revolution, you have to go with notarized paper showing your descent from someone who fought for our freedom. And then in 1777, France joined the battle as well. They came to aid the colonists. They were going to help the colonists remove the, the English from their home. Now it's no secret that George Washington was appointed head of the Continental Army. George Washington was also our first president after the war was finished. Now the war ended in 1783 and it, and it was at the Treaty of Paris that representative of the English crown met with representatives from the new founded United States to sign an agreement that the colonists, the Patriots, were no longer a part of Mother England. They were their own country. Now I've said before, the United States is a republic and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God. That's part of our Pledge of Allegiance. This means that every colony, every became a state or every territory became a state with its own government that mirrored the government of the federal government. So like in the state of Georgia, we have a governor. Our governor right now is Kemp, Governor Kemp. So he is the appointed leader of the state of Georgia. Now this isn't a permanent position. He will end up having to be replaced by somebody else. They have a time limit, an expiration date, if you will, on how long they can serve. This was done on purpose. This was done on purpose so that we would never experience a tyrant or a dictator. Same with the federal government. Every four years we have an election and somebody gets elected. Right now, obviously, our president is President Trump. Now it is 2020, so we have election coming up in November. If Trump wins again, he will serve for another four years. After eight years or two consecutive terms as the president, he has to step down. He cannot run again. And the establishment of a republic here in the United States was of the utmost importance. The Republic seems like the more logical way of governing a people where the people actually have control over their own lives. Because again, here in America, we don't have a monarchy. Nobody is born into divine right here. All men are created equal. We all have the same opportunities. And yes, we've had growing pains getting to that equality. Now, of course, Savannah is in the state of Georgia, and Savannah was founded in 1733 by General Oglethorpe. Now, this, of course, was before the American Revolution. And as I said before, Georgia was a prisoner state. So Georgia was a state where England would bring its prisoners who were in debt, for debtor's prison, which doesn't exist anymore but did then, or whatever, when their jails were filled up, they would just come dump them in Georgia. Now, ironically, a Georgia... Georgia was typically a loyalist state during the American Revolution. Most people in the state of Georgia wanted to be continue to be a part of the crown. I've told you guys before that my family line is not actually from Georgia. I have one grandmother from South Georgia and she thinks that her family came up from New Orleans because she believes that her ancestors were French. But because Savannah was in Georgia and Georgia was a loyalist state, Savannah was easy for the British to take during the American Revolution. And they took siege of Savannah in 1778 until the end of the war in 1783. Now between 1783 and 1789, the United States took a little bit to figure out how to set up the Constitution, what exactly they wanted to do. And in 1789, that's when George Washington was inaugurated as our first president. So by 1790, the state of Georgia and Savannah were still trying to figure out how to work itself as its own city independent from Mother England. At that point, Savannah had been given the title as the capital of the state of Georgia. But as we know now, they only held that title until about 1804. In 1804, the capital was moved to Milledgeville and then soon after moved to Atlanta where it is today. So the 1790 in 
got its name because this was the date when Savannah was formulated as its own city. The 1790 Inn is a restaurant. It is also a tavern and a boarding house with 14 rooms. Now, originally the building consisted of two parts, adding a third part in later. The first and second building were built between 1821 and 1823. And then the third was built in 1888. Now, obviously this is many years removed from the original opening of the 1790. But as time went on, this building became a staple in Savannah society. Now we have three known ghosts that haunt this location. We're going to start with the first ghost of Anne or Anna. I've heard both names. So whatever you've heard, Anne with an E or Anna with an A at the end. Now Anna tends to live in room 204. I've mentioned in almost every video that Savannah is a river town. Now the story goes that Anna was arranged to be married to another man. And this man actually paid for Anna to come to America. Well, on her voyage over to America, she met a young sailor and fell in love with him. Now it's unclear about her manner of death, if it was a suicide or a homicide. Some people say that Anna or Anne dropped or jumped out of the window when she watched her lover disappear in a boat back down the Savannah River never to be seen again. Another story claims that her husband, her arranged husband who paid for her to come over to this new world was so angry that she was in love with another man that he pushed her out the window, killing her. Regardless, Anna still hangs around today and you can actually sometimes hear her crying in the room. She also likes to move items around. And if you're really lucky, she might even tuck you in at night. Now our second ghost is a little boy named Thaddeus. Now Thaddeus likes to hang out in the restaurant and the tavern. Thaddeus apparently is a very happy little boy and often likes to play with your coins. So if you place pennies down on the bar, sometimes Thaddeus will come and move them. And then that leads us to our third ghost. This ghost, more people are afraid of than not, because this ghost doesn't seem to be too happy. Now again, we've mentioned before that with the slave trade into the southern part of the United States, a culture developed. And this was the Gullah culture. You can watch my video on the Gullahs or refer back to Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And with this Gullah culture, there grew a new faith. This faith brought elements of some African religion along with Christianity, along with the practice of root magic. This resulted in what we now call voodoo or hoodoo. Now in the kitchen of the 1790s inn lives the spirit of a long gone slave woman who was also notoriously a voodoo queen in Savannah. And apparently this woman does not like it when newcomers come into her kitchen. She will violently throw pots and pans across the kitchen. And in fact, a lot of the employees say that even when nobody's there and they're closing up for the night, they'll be in the front room and they can hear things being tossed around inside of the kitchen. But the silver lining is that after a while, while apparently this woman starts to get familiar with the regulars in the kitchen and does start to allow them in. So if you're looking to go to a place in Savannah that not only has a cultural significance like the founding of the United States, but you also want it to have a little bit of folklore and a little bit of ghost, the 1790s Inn is the place for you. If you really want to amp it up, request to stay in room 204 so that you have a one-on-one -on -one experience with our ghost, Anne. Don't forget to go down to the tavern and show Thaddeus some of your pennies. And if you're real lucky, maybe you'll get to experience our ghost in the kitchen. Now, not many guests get to actually see the kitchen, but I'm sure if you go there, you can find some employees to tell you some stories. All right, guys, thank you yet again through sitting for sitting through another story. Again, thank you 
to Josh McKay for doing our music and for Todd Broderick for helping us edit. Also, a huge appreciation to you guys for hanging in and having fun with us as we go through this series. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.